Okay, let me do the introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, 3D GV seminar series this week. Today is our great pleasure to have J Professor Jay Gao from Rutgers University. Uh, Jay is a full professor at the Rutgers Computer Science Department. She works uh, at the intersection of graph, uh, algorithms, machine learning, uh, data science, and these applications in graphics uh, vision. Uh, health, right? Biology, okay, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And today she will talk about uh, something at the intersection of uh, differential geometry and graph learning. So the title of the talk is "Graph Rich Flow and Applications in Network Analysis and Learning." Let's welcome. Thanks, Qixing. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, so it's a great honor to be uh, invited to give a talk here. So I will um, talk about our recent work on graph rich flow and applications in network analysis and learning. Um, so we have actually a lot of graph data, a lot of data in a real world setting that come in the form of very large complex networks. Um, so examples of such complex networks include social networks, uh, biological networks, the internet, the web, and also networks coming from other type of data such as mobility. And um, you know, down below, I'm you know showing a few examples of such large complex networks, uh, ranging from autonomous systems, uh, you know, Facebook, a network from Facebook, um, social network. Uh, mobility data from uh, taxis and also a brain connectome network. So all of these networks uh, arising from nature share many interesting properties. Um, some examples include small word phenomena. The diameter of the network is often uh, a lot smaller than the size of the network. And the degree distribution often follows a power law degree distribution and their interesting structures, such as community structures, um, represented by clustered, closely knit groups of vertices in such graphs. So in general, we want to understand uh, the properties of such graph data and complex networks. And there are many interesting research problems. Um, some problems are involved of understanding a single network. For example, given one network, um, what kind of structural properties can I find? And you know, examples such as community detection and um, some problems in graph learning, such as label propagation and prediction. So given uh, properties of some vertices predict the properties of other vertices. And some problems are involved of understanding a family of networks. Um, for example, comparing two graphs uh, from a family, what are the similarities, what are the commonalities? Or maybe look at a large family of input graph, you know, learn a representation of this input family. Uh, you know, examples include graph generative models. So I want to talk about some of our work uh, that involve geometric tools to help with such analysis. So I will introduce graph curvature and graph curvature flow for the analysis of complex networks. So let me start with um, a, a quick review of curvature in classical geometry and also discrete curvature definitions in the literature. So traditionally, we understand curvature as like curvature of a point on a surface. And for example, if you take a point on a sphere, that point has positive curvature. If you take a point in the plane, you have zero curvature locally. And if you take a point on a hyperbolic plane, you have negative curvature. I'm also showing some examples of uh, different curvatures on the slide. In discrete setting, there has been a lot of work trying to study similar notions for graph data. And um, I'm going through a number of definitions, um, uh, you know, started with curvatures defined for triangulated surfaces and curvatures defined for, you know, general graphs. 
Um, so to start with, um, you know, maybe people are familiar with curvatures defined on a, a triangulated surface. So here you have surface to be triangulated and uh, for each vertex, you have a number of triangles in the neighborhood of the vertex and you could, you know, look at all the angles um, at the vertex and take the summation of the angles. So discrete Gaussian curvature is defined to be the difference of two pi and the sum of all these corner angles. So if the summation of the angles is exactly two pi, that means locally all of these triangles fit locally on a uh, plane and therefore curvature is zero. And uh, you could also get positive or negative curvature when the summation is not exactly two pi. And um, also what has been done in the literature um, is to establish the connection of you know, curvature and a metric setting. And this is the notion of the circle packing metric where uh, you could imagine you have circles defined on vertices and the intersection pattern of the circles you know, define a distance measure. And by, by modifying the circle packing metric, by modifying the radii of these uh, uh, circles on vertices, one could change the curvature of this triangulation and therefore also change the shape of this triangulated surface. So Ricci flow is a process that would modify the uh, metric to change the curvature to be like the target curvature. So for example, in one of the early applications we did, we actually use this notion to uh, tackle a problem in wireless networking where we want to change the shape of a wireless network to a target shape where in a certain routing um, uh, algorithms are going to be easier. So in this picture, you can see on the left hand, I have a shape which is somewhat irregular. And by using curvature flow, we are able to modify the shape of the network. And in particular, by modifying the shape of the holes to make it to be easy for um, distributed routing. So there's also a lot of other work trying to generalize curvature to the graph setting. So um, um, I'm going to introduce a number of them, including both global notions and also local notions, and then focus on what we use for our applications. So uh, earlier, it has been discovered that if you look at real world uh, complex networks, some of these networks have global negative curvature, and this is defined by Gromov's thin triangle property. So let me show a picture here. So the thin triangle property says the following. If you have three vertices, A, B, and C, and look at the shortest path between the three pairs. And then if you look at any point on one of the shortest paths, in this case, a point on the shortest path from B to C, and calculate the distance to the union of the other two shortest paths. And you know, if this uh, distance is at most uh, delta, then it is said that you know, this metric or this graph has a delta uh, Gromov uh, uh, property. So in particular, if you look at a graph which behaves like a tree, then by trying the same triangle property, we see that delta is actually exact. Exactly zero. So a graph that has a small delta value is believed to have a negative curvature, or in other words, it behaves like a tree, it is tree-like uh, property. So the interesting thing is that such a notion has been tested on a number of real-world graphs, uh, including the internet topology and a number of other topologies, the social network, and um, you know, surprisingly, all of these have uh, negative curvature. So um, there are a number of consequences following this. For example, the internet topology is uh, believed to be tree-like, and there's also a core in the center of the 
uh, network such that you know shortest paths uh, visit this core um, and congestion at the core might be high, but there are also uh, advantage of this for speeding up distance oracle query or shortest path queries. Now, this notion of Gromov hyperbolicity is a, is a global notion, it's a global curvature property. And um, in the following, we're going to introduce uh, a number of local curvature notions. Um, that is a fine-grained uh, characterization of curvature at vertices. So for example, we want to ask what edges are negatively curved or positively curved, and what are the properties of this local curvature uh, as related to uh, other network properties. So um, another notion, which is uh, a local curvature definition is called uh, Foreman curvature. And this is defined for a graph, uh, possibly weighted graph, or in general, a cell complex. And um, here I'm giving a very simple definition. So the, uh, uh, the long definition includes a weighted setting is, um, uh, you know, it, it's not as easy to understand as this one. But basically for the simple setting, when we have just a graph with all the edges of weight of one, and one can define curvature, form and curvature for each edge to be the following, is four minus the degree of U, one vertex, minus the degree of V, another vertex, plus three times the number of triangles, that contain U and V. And here we're assuming that we take all the triangles to be the faces of the graph. So we're, we're taking a graph and think about it as a uh, simple complex. And um, you know, this notion could be generalized to weighted settings and to you know, other kind of cell complex and has also been evaluated on a number of real graphs um, to show that the curvature is related to vulnerability, to robustness of a, a graph to identify vulnerable edges, et cetera. Um, but in um, our group, we have been focusing on a uh, different discrete curvature definition, which is this Olivier uh, Ricci curvature. So to give the intuition, we have a graph and I want to define, again, curvature for each edge of the graph. So we're going to look at, um, again, the graph may be weighted. So we're looking at shortest path distance of uh, pairs of vertices on the graph. So here, we're going to define a distribution for edge x, y. We're going to define a distribution on x and x neighborhood. Um, and also a distribution on y and y's neighbors. And given the two distribution, I'm going to compare the neighborhood of x with neighborhood of y and look for the distance between neighbors of x to distance between neighbors of y. And intuitively, I want to compare this with the distance from x and y and look at whether it is easier or it is shorter to go from the neighbor of X to neighbors of Y compared to taking this edge X and Y. So formally, the Olivier curvature is defined by the following formula. So if I look at the two distribution, one defined on the neighborhood of X, one defined on the neighborhood of Y, I'm going to look at the optimal transport distance to go from one distribution to another by taking you know, the shortest possible path to transfer the distribution. And this um, optimal transport distance divided by the length uh, or the distance between X and Y, and then we take one minus this ratio. This is defined as the Olivier Ricci curvature for the edge X and Y. So this, um, curvature definition defined for each edge is able to characterize locally whether we have a dense neighborhood or locally we have a sparse neighborhood where XY is possibly a local bridge. So to help with 
understanding this curvature definition and relate to the um, a classical notion of uh, continuous curvature, let's look at a few examples. So here I have a, a grid, a grid graph, and we have um, vertex X and vertex Y. So the neighbor of X um, uh, are labeled in red and neighbors of Y are labeled in blue. So if I define a distribution, for example, here, I'm just taking a uniform distribution. Um, we could see that the distribution on X and the neighbors of X can be easily translated to the distribution on Y and neighbors of Y. And such a translation, in fact, gave me a optimal transport distance to be exactly one, which is the distance between X and Y. So in other words, if I look at my curvature definition, the, water, the, the optimal transport distance and dxy are the same, and therefore curvature will become 1 minus 1, and that will be 0. So this matches with our intuition that if you have a two-dimensional grid network, then locally it does look like, you know, for every edge, everywhere you do have zero curvature. Now, correspondingly, one could write down a, a the, the formula for um, Olivia Ricci curvature for the case of a um, tree. And in this case, the curvature is uh, taken as one divided by the degree of X plus one over degree of Y minus one. And um, except the edges that connect to leaf nodes everywhere actually the curvature would be uh, negative. So indeed, a tree is a very sparsely connected uh, a network. And we do expect kind of the, the behavior to be similar to a negatively curved uh, uh, surface. So uh, yes, we get negative curvature here as well. So for complete graph, you know, following this uh, definition, we can see that it is actually easier to go from neighbors of X to neighbors of Y. In this case of complete graph, all the neighbors, the neighborhoods are the same. Um, and therefore the curvature turns out to be positive for all the edges. So, you know, with this definition, we can use it for understanding properties of, you know, real world complex networks. So here I'm showing an example of a um, autonomous uh, system topology. This is a real world topology on the internet. And I'm uh, marking the curvature of the different edges uh, by the colors. So blue colors mean this curvature is positive. Red color means curvature is negative and green color means curvature is roughly zero. So one could see that the network uh, is uh, partitioned by clusters of uh, groups that have positive curvature and the backbone edges on the uh, internet uh, that are believed to be like important edges connecting different uh, uh, smaller networks actually have a negative curvature. Again, this uh, corresponds intuitively very nicely to that earlier study of the global negative hyperbolicity property of the internet. Indeed, the graph is largely a tree and large, I mean tree-like and largely negatively curved. Um, so apart from curvature, uh, what I want to mention mostly is this notion of curvature flow and also applications of this. So in classical uh, geometry, whenever we have uh, curvature and metric, uh, we look at uh, a potential, uh, uh, you know, this, this dynamic process where curvature is changed um, by changing the metric so that the curvature uh, diffuse as in the heat diffusion. So this notion of curvature flow, Ricci flow was initially introduced by Hamilton. And um, here on the left, you can see examples of uh, Ricci flow uh, operating on a uh, on the case of a surface, right? And you have 
the initial manifold where the shape is very irregular, and gradually you want the curvature to diffuse. And you know, on in the mark part of the surface, the curvature become uniform, uh, but there could be singularities. For example, here you see that this two part of that you know, surface start to grow apart and there's a you know, singularity point in the middle. And um, interestingly, um, what I will introduce next will be a process that is very similar to this, but operating on a graph. So on the right hand side, we actually have the Olivier Ricci curvature defined for all the edges of the network. And again, you can see certain edges have negative curvature, certain edges have positive curvature. And then we're going to change the length of the edges in the same manner so that the curvature is um, uh, going to diffuse and uh, iteratively uh, converge to uh, you know the same value, and uh, what happens is if we look at the the network, uh, it appears that certain edges are becoming longer, while other edges are shorter. So uh, in this case, we could imagine that. It's very similar to the continuous setting that we start to experience this notion of singularity that you know part of the network grow apart, and um, the connection between these two cluster of uh, vertices become uh, longer and longer. And you know at some point, if we want to just cut the edges, we can partition the graph into like separate uh, components, and these components um, actually map. Uh, naturally to the community structure or the clustering property of a graph. So let me go through, uh, introduce the uh, formula for um, the Ricci flow here defined on the graph setting. So here I have dxy uh, to be the edge weight of uh, between x and y and kappa to be the Olivier Ricci curvature defined on the edge X and Y. And epsilon is a step size um, that control how much we change uh, the, the edge weight. And the Ricci flow is represented by this iterative process where we change the edge weight um, with a factor that is proportional to the curvature. Um, so the distance is actually uh, longer if the curvature is negative and distance becomes shorter if curvature is positive. And we multiply on the right hand side with a global normalization factor just to make sure the you know, summation of all the distances remain fixed. So this intuition of this Ricci flow again is by modifying the edge lens, we hope to get the curvature everywhere to be the same. And uh, the, the process continues until the edge weight doesn't change so much. So in some of our implementations, we actually use different uh, uh, types of distributions in the definition of of curvature. So for example, we could use just simply a uniform distribution um, um, in all the neighbors uh, of a vertex, uh, or uh, in, in certain applications, you know, we want to speed up. So we discount uh, the neighbors that are far away. So we assign distribution so that the probability mass is um, you know, inverse proportional to the exponent of the uh, distance of a neighbor from X. So this way, if a neighbor is really far away, I'm, I, I'm like not really considering that one to be an important neighbor. So, um, okay. So before I show applications, I want to say a few words about um, this entire picture of, um, you know, Ricci flow for the different discrete setting. Um, so, of course, one important question in theory is to ask, you know, what happens with this uh, Ricci flow? So do, does it converge all the time? And does it generate a unique solution? Um, so this is 
in a very important uh, question. For the classical manifold setting, there's a very deep theory there. And um, the understanding of this problem actually contributes to the proof of the Poincaré conjecture. So that is like a huge amount of work that I'm not going to mention. And for the discrete uh, Gaussian curvature setting on a triangulation, so this theory has been established for convergence, for existence of a solution, and for uniqueness of the uh, a final uh, result. And um, you know, David Gu and also um, uh, Professor Feng Luo, they have you know had a number of papers on this topic um, that basically kind of handle and solve this question. For discrete curvature on graphs, unfortunately, um, this problem is still largely unknown. So we have had you know, analysis for extremely special setting um, when uh, you know, we have the, you know, the graph of a certain very special format. And in general, um, there's recent work uh, that uh, considers a continuous time setting uh, a continuous flow instead of the discrete setting that we use in our applications. And with the assumption that, you know, the edge UV is always Jay, we could not hear you. Hello? Yeah, so you, you may continue. I, th I think I'm, I'm lost. <laughs> I hope, uh, okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. I hope you can see the slides now. I think I'm somehow dropped out, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You, you, you all can continue. All right, yeah, okay. So I, apart from you know, all these major important questions on the theory of uh, graph Ricci flow remain largely unknown, I want to mention, uh, some of the applications of graph Vichy flow for network analysis. So I want to look at three applications here. One about, um, let's start with community detection and then I'll talk about uh, network alignment and graph neural networks. So um, as I said earlier, we, uh, when we run Vichy flow, um, it's you know, interesting that Basically, the community structure is automatically identified because vertices belonging to the same uh, community because they're densely connected. So the curvature of the edges within a community um, are generally positive, so they get shorter and shorter over time. Well, the edges across communities get longer um, over time, so at some point they become so long, so you know we could actually perform a search array to remove them. So here I'm showing a uh, example of this process. So what happens here is this classical uh, karate club network, and um, on the left I show the edges of the network having uh, different curvature, some positive, some negative. And the running Ricci flow, I'm trying to get all the uh, curvatures to be the same. And the consequence of that is the edges are given different lengths. So um, in the second column, we see that the network is kind of stretched into two parts. 
and the edges between the two part gets much longer. On the bottom, you can see that here is a histogram of the edge weight. Now, very clearly, there's a group of edges that have edge weight much larger than the rest of the edges. And by cutting, by removing these edges that are very long, we actually get uh, 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 naturally these two group of vertices that correspond to the ground truth uh, a community detection result. Um, and in fact, we could also run which you flow further and here um, to discover the hierarchical structure. So when we look at the edge weights, we realize that there is another group of edges that are um, you know, relatively much longer than the rest of the vertices. So if we remove this set of uh, edges, we can partition the bottom cluster into two smaller clusters to discover the refined community structure in the original network. So this behavior is observed in many other networks. So here I show a different uh, uh, network from uh, Facebook. So this is a social network with um, about like 792 vertices and um, over 14,000 edges. And the colors represent the ground truth community uh, labeled uh, for this data set. And initially we have this hairy ball that the structure of you know, the, the network could become you know, very unclear. But once we apply Ricci flow, we can see that the, um, you know, the edges become, the length of the edges are changed. And after we remove these edges that are long, we actually get to the community partition in the right picture where, you know, we get uh, a, a number of uh, communities. And you can see that, you know, many of the different colors are largely separated into different communities. A third example I show, again, the same algorithm applied for the brain connectome network. So here, this is a, uh, again, a real data set where we have a um, you know, human a brain going through the fMRI scan to get the activity uh, recorded. Um, and we're looking at the resting state um, data where edges are defined by the correlation of the signals of different part of the brain. So um, on the left, figure, we show the original uh, brain data where, you know, edges with correlation above a threshold are kept, where edges with low correlation are removed. And in the middle figure, we run Ricci flow to remove edges that are believed to be across community. And therefore, um, you can see the original graph is uh, partitioned into a um, like basically three very large community and two smaller community and some dangling like isolated nodes. And this, you know, map nicely to the, uh, the uh, natural uh, structure of the brain believed to represent important uh, functional parts. And we could again, you know, perform uh, Ricci flow uh, on this network uh, as well to discover the fine grain hierarchical community structure as in the in the right picture. So, um, you know, to show that uh, a community detection is indeed a uh, you know a valid thing that the uh, surgery the cutoff parameter can be easily selected, we actually show the color the following figure. Uh, uh, you know, both the cutoff parameter, which is the X axis, and also the uh, modularity uh, measure of the components. So basically, um, this is on a uh, artificial uh, model network, so we can control the community size and so on. And um, it can be seen that if you look at that uh, weight cutoff, right? So first of all, it's very clear. There is a, uh, a plateau 
And over there, we can see that the modularity is also pretty high. So when you choose any uh, um, um, in cutoff parameters within that range, actually, you know, you get the same uh, result of very high modularity of the uh, consequence, uh, you know, from this partitioning, from this community detection. So um, also, you know, just compared with many other community detection algorithms in the literature. So we tried uh, the Ricci flow method and uh, you know, other community detection algorithm on a uh, artificial network. So we can control the size of the community. We can also control how likely is the graph having a community structure. So the X axis, the parameter mu would control whether or not you have a community structure. So smaller mu means you actually have very clear community structure. Well, large mu means the network does not have a clear community structure or um, in general, maybe just a single community. So when we run different algorithms, we know that eventually when mu is large enough, then community detection is going to fail because there's no community, you know, there's just a single, single community. And the behavior of the Ricci flow method compared to other methods, um, the advantage is very clear that, you know, Ricci flow can maintain uh, high quality until at a very sharp threshold, the performance starts to drop. So this is a, you know, sharp transition compared to, you know, the, you know, some of the other methods where the quality starts to drop early on uh, before the network lose the community structure. So, um, so that is one very interesting and natural application of Ricci flow for analysis of large networks. And in the following two applications, I want to look at uh, not just a single network, but also how to compare uh, two networks or how to understand uh, like a family of networks. So first of all, a, um, a nice property we have discovered is once we run Ricci flow, we're going to give the edges a certain weight, a length. And, um, and this we call the Ricci flow metric. So with this weight, we can compute shortest path of you know, any pair of vertices uh, on the network. And we can talk about the distance between two vertices using this metric. And uh, we believe that this is actually a useful measure to quantify the distance between two vertices on the graph. So, you know, this kind of distance measure is useful for many, many applications. Um, so let's come back to like the question, right? In a network, what is a proper measure of the distance between two vertices? In the literature, we actually, uh, you know, for different applications, we may have different answers for what is a good measure for distance. For example, on the internet, um, you know, often people use the delay, right? So uh, for two computers on the internet, we send a message from one to the other and we measure what is the delay. So, you know, this is used basically universal like everywhere for the application. Now, the challenge of this is, um, it's time consuming, right? You have to do the measurement and sometimes it's not possible uh, if we do not have uh, a control. And it also depends a lot on the traffic. So this is time varying, it's changing. Um, for different networks, for example, for social networks, you know, how to measure the length of a edge. Uh, again, one often use intuitive measures such as tie strengths. And this is you know, natural coming from this application, but the trouble is it's not always easy to measure. And you know, apart from this, you know, other kinds of measures are often used in applications, for example, hop count. So um, you know, between two vertices, we could count the number of hops on the shortest path and use it to define the distance between two vertices. Now for many small word graphs, the problem with hop count is that 
often it doesn't give you enough resolution. So um, all of these complex networks have small word properties. So the hop count measure gives a integer value and that is often very limited, you know, a, a small integer value, um, um, you know, that does not pre, you know, provide the, the uh, enough resolution to differentiate uh, distance between different uh, uh, vertices. So um, one could also try, for example, graph embedding. So take a graph, embed using some embedding algorithm and then use the distance in the embedding as the edge weight, and then use shortest path distance to quantify the uh, proximity of vertices. And um, you know, spectral embedding or other kind of embedding are often used. And um, the problem with some of these embedding is that they are often sensitive to noise. So I'm going to show a number of um, figures uh, to show like the, to give visually the idea of sensitivity when we have noise, for example, we delete or insert uh, edges or vertices in the network. Now, how much does that change the, uh, uh, the distance measure? So in this figure, I'm showing, again, a small graph and showing different embeddings of the graph in the plane and I'm going to give the edge weight as the distance in the embedding. And uh, further, I'm going to remove uh, like two edges from the graph and then compute the embedding again and then compute the distance at the shortest path distance to, you know, in, in the embedding. So um, the color of the vertices are uh, used to demonstrate how big the change is. So if the I'm measuring the distance to a common node, I believe to be the node number four, the vertex in yellow. And um, if the distance to the yellow vertex before and after the removal of two edges change a lot, then the color becomes like very dark. So this, dark red means that distance is increased you know, with this network change by a significant amount, by 40%. And that dark uh, blue vertex shows that the distance dropped by about like 29% after the uh, edges are removed. And the left picture shows what happens with the spectral embedding. On the right picture, we show this is a spring embedding where we fix a number of vertices and we treat all the edges to be like a spring, like a rubber band. So, you know, the vertices uh, are placed when you know, all the rubber bands stabilize. Uh, and then we use the position to be the embedding uh, uh, in, in the underlying space. And again, we do the same thing. We measure how much does the distance change before and after uh, two edges are removed from the graph? And you can see again, like, you know, the color of the vertices are, you know, pretty much pink. That means you have a decent amount of change with the dynamics. And um, the next slide actually shows uh, more robust uh, uh, measures. Um, on the left, this is actually the hop count. So this is the number of hops of each vertex to that common uh, vertex in yellow. And it shows that before and after the removal of the two edges in red, in fact, if you look at the hop count, it pretty much doesn't change. And this is not surprising because, you know, due to the small word property, you have actually like lots of redundancy, lots of duplicate, like, you know, uh, a multiple shortest paths in, in any kind of real world complex graph. So, you know, hop count is actually a very robust measure when you have noise introduced in the graph. So the um, vertices, you see the color of the vertices is pretty much uh, white, meaning no change at all. On the right, this is what we get from the uh, Ricci flow metric. And, 
And compared to the half count, we do see some small amount of changes, but still this is uh, very minor. Like the, the change is in the order of 3% or 4%. Um, you know, many of the vertices in, or distances do not experience a large change at all. And we believe that this is, uh, this illustrate the robustness property of this Ricci flow metric. The intuition is that, well, we're trying to get the network to be flat everywhere. We're trying to discover the underlying structure of the network, um, you know, in the sense that the, we're not trying to find any particular embedding, but we're trying to make the edge ways to make sense in a global, you know, global manner. So in other words, small changes of edges in the original graph um, you know, are unlikely to change this global uh, you know, structure of the graph. Um, and that partly explains you know, intuitively you know, what we see here of this robustness property. So with this property, um, you know, we can make use of this in a number of other applications. Oh, okay, one more figure just to show that uh, uh, the uh, Ricci flow metric is actually fairly robust. So if you look at uh, like, again, percentage of you know, ch changes if, you know, by using the histogram, then the spectral embedding you have you know, changed like all over the place. Well, for the you know, Ricci flow metric, the top one and the bottom one using slightly different like distribution, we have uh, you know, very robust uh, 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 measures against the network changes. So this robustness property allow us to um, you know, handle uh, a number of uh, challenges coming from the dynamics or you know, changes to a graph. So one of the application is this uh, a problem of network alignment or approximate uh, you know, graph isomorphism. So graph isomorphism is a, is a, a well-known problem where you are given two graphs, G, G1, G2, and the goal is to find a one-to-one -one correspondence of the vertices. So if you look at the two graphs here, um, they look differently, but they're actually exactly the same graph. So if you match the vertex in blue on the left graph to the vertex in blue on the right, you see the edges match exactly. So in practice, we actually look at approximate versions of in you know, a graph isomorphism. For example, we have two networks that are believed to be like the social network of the same group of people. Um, we want to see whether we can find correspondence here. And of course, anything you get from you know, real world data are going to be noisy, right? So you, know, you may have missing edges, you may have edges that are um, placed there by mistake, right? So we want the graph alignment algorithm to be robust to this. So we're using the robust of the Ricci flow metric for this uh, application here. So um, the uh, main idea is whenever we have a good distance measure of like how far away two vertices are in the network, we can use this to identify in some sense a coordinate system. And that will allow us to say, okay, this vertex is positioned with respect to some other vertices, and we can use this to find correspondence or alignment. So here, for example, if we have a set of points in the plane, and suppose we have uh, you know, three landmark nodes that are established by the correspondence from you know, left figure to the right figure, then for any other point, we can use the barycentric coordinate to identify the position with respect to that three landmark nodes and use this as a coordinate system. So if I have one point P on the left with the coordinate to the three landmarks to be, for example, exactly the same as the barycentric coordinate of P prime um, to you know, the, the three other like corresponding landmarks, then we can say, okay, P and P prime should be 
a one-to-one -one correspondence. So on a network, because we have this robust distance measure, we can basically do the same thing. Now we are going to have for the two graphs, we run Ricci flow, we find the distance measure. And suppose we have a number of landmarks, for example, those very high degree vertices identified. And suppose they are, um, um, we find the correspondence already for the landmark nodes. And then for any other vertex, we can use the distance to these landmarks to be the coordinates. And we can use the coordinates to find the vertices that should be matched. So this is, again, like the main idea of the algorithm, but I'm skipping all the details. Um, but I'm showing in the following uh, some quick uh, simulation uh, or experiment results. So here we have a both a artificial like random uh, graph where we remove uh, uh, you know, certain uh, vertices or edges. And uh, we try to find correspondence of the original network and the network once we remove certain vertices and edges. And we show that compared to alternative solutions, um, even with a small number of landmarks, so here I'm using two, three, four, five landmarks, and um, the algorithm by using Ricci flow can find a very high uh, accuracy of correspondence. You know, well, other measures, they suffer either by uh, not having enough resolution, for example, for hop count, or they suffer because the distance measure could be uh, very sensitive to the dynamics and therefore performance kind of drop. Now on the right uh, figures, this is a protein-protein interaction network. It's real data. And again, we remove edges and we try to see whether we can find correspondence. A very similar kind of result can be obtained that you know, Ricci flow can do better than you know, alternative methods. So um, a last application I want to very briefly mention is um, you know, partly ongoing work of using the Ricci curvature for and the Ricci flow for graph learning. So um, in a graph neural network is probably the state of art for learning very large, uh, you know, real world data. And the, you know, here I'm used, I'm, I'm explaining for the application of node classification. So for example, I have labels for vertices and I have uh, for, you know, part of the vertices, I have the ground truth label. And I'm trying to use this to predict the label of the remaining vertices. So graph neural network works in the following manner that we take the graph topology and we apply uh, uh, you know, the, the neural network architecture directly on the graph topology. So we may go through like multiple layers and for each layer, we probably will run uh, like local aggregation or convolutional layer uh, to try to summarize the you know, features uh, of the neighbors and going through multiple layers. So this feature is abstracted and learned uh, iteratively until we have enough knowledge you know, through the multiple layers to apply for the remaining uh, vertices. So one problem that is has been identified in this type of graph neural network is the vulnerability to um, the topology of the input graph. So for example, imagine an adversary uh, who can uh, inject noise to the initial graph by removing edges or insertion of fake edges to the original graph. Now this turns out can have a um, substantial damage to the performance of the network. So like a small percentage of edges deleted or inserted to the original graph can hurt the learning performance uh, of the model. So we wonder, since we have this very robust measure of distances, now maybe we can use that to help to resolve or in, with this 
a vulnerability issue of graph neural network. So we propose to use this measure in the following way, that instead of applying the graph neural network directly on the input graph, we try to um, you know, learn the graph uh, distance representation, the graph Ricci flow metric, um, and then try to resample from that Ricci flow metric uh, new graphs and apply this resampled graph plug in in every uh, different layers of the graph neural network. Now, the point is we don't want to rely on the particular input edges per se, but rather we want to capture the global like structural property, the, um, the property of you know, the community structure and, and many other global structures encoded by the graph topology. Um, and we try to extract a more robust feature from that. So um, one quick example here shows that you know, what is happening. So I have like originally, this is a adjacency matrix on the top left corner. So this graph actually has five communities. So this is a artificial network just for visualization. And the um, there are densely edges within the community and there are also certain edges across the community. But you may notice that um, you know, some pairs of communities do not have any edges at all. Now, the, the dot in red are actually noise introduced by an adversary. In fact, here we're using a very powerful adversary. The, the adversary will run an optimization, trying to inject edges so that to uh, make the performance to drop as much as possible. So these red dots are chosen specifically by the powerful adversary to hurt the performance of the original model. Now, you know, we take the entire graph with that noise and we run Ricci flow to uh, recover the uh, edge weights. And that is what we get in the, uh, on the right. And um, here we see that largely we still have that community structure, the five communities, and we have, uh, um, you know, basically, you know, the, the structure is recovered in some sense. And on the bottom left, I'm sampling a graph from that Ricci flow metric. And this is done by using a Gaussian filter. So basically, a, a, um, a pair of vertices is selected to be an edge. You know, with a probability that depend on the distance of uh, in between this pair. And again, a sampled graph inherit largely the same structure as before. Um, but because we're using random sampling, so this is not the same, you know, not this differ a lot actually from the original graph, although the general structure is kept. And on the bottom right, we actually show the intersection of two graphs, both to be random sample from the Ricci flow metric. And the interesting thing is that you see for those part of, uh, for those you know, community that shouldn't have any edges at all. In fact, the intersection indeed basically get rid of a lot of the noise that was um, uh, adversarially injected. And we believe that this is partly the reason why we're able to um, you know, address this vulnerability because this noise that did not support the global structure, in fact, was not going to be sampled a lot. And when you take like multiple samples, actually this, um, this noisy edges are not emphasized or you know, not paid attention to during the learning part and therefore uh, the damage of this noise to the final performance is largely reduced. Anyway, so we have some figures that demonstrate the performance improvement over um, you know, um, other alternative approach. And the interesting thing is that even with no noise introduced, our method often 
get again the best performance compared to others. Um, again, I believe this is due to the capability of summarizing effectively the, the graph topology um, at different resolution uh, and therefore uh, recovering you know, the, you know, the, the, the important information that should be remembered about the graph. Um, yeah, I'm going to just skip that, but um, come to a, a quick summary of, uh, of the talk. So um, we're using um, notions that come from classical geometry uh, adapted to the uh, discrete graph setting and uses uh, for uh, a number of interesting uh, graph analysis applications. And I want to say that this is different from uh, graph embedding. So we're not producing a embedding, uh, but rather we just you know, use this Ricci flow to give you know, all the edges different lengths and use the lens to introduce uh, approximate measure of vertices in the graph. So embedding of a graph is commonly used in you know, many network applications. Um, but um, the challenge for graph embedding is to decide on a number of important parameters. For example, what is the underlying space we use for the graph embedding? Um, if you use Euclidean, you know, what is the dimension, right? Um, we may use non-Euclidean, for example, hyperbolic space, or maybe even a hybrid uh, setting. Uh, but again, one need to make the decision of what is the underlying space and the choice actually put uh, some constraint, um, you know, we have to have homogeneously, you know, the entire network embedded in the, in the same space. And that may introduce, um, I believe, unnecessary uh, constraint or distortion uh, to the problem. And um, we're also interested in uh, other related graph analysis uh, problems. For example, many real world graphs have a evolving manner, right? So Twitter network uh, change you know, over time. So we want to understand not just the analysis of a single network, but also a evolving network. And the same applies to like brain data, right? So human brain evolve uh, with growth. And we want to look at, again, how does the evolution uh, uh, how can we capture the graph evolution by using, again, interesting measures of the network topology? And we we'll look forward to more applications of this graph Ricci flow, uh, in particular, possibly due to the robustness property of this metric. And last, I want to say this is joint work with uh, like many colleagues, in particular, I want to mention uh, Professor uh, Xianfeng Gu, David Gu from Stony Brook, we have collaborated for like many years. And also Professor Feng Luo from Rutgers, uh, you, know, you know, they contribute a lot to you know, all of this work. And um, I also want to mention Professor Chao Chen from, uh, again, Stony Brook University. Uh, with, uh, with him, we work on this graph neural network applications. And, um, a couple of my current students, Hao Tian and Cheng Yuan, um, also are actively working on some of the problems here. And um, you know, a, a prior student, uh, Chen Chun Ni, uh, produced a software package on GitHub on um, uh, the graph Ricci flow and the graph curvature. So the link is down below. So if anyone wants to a play with curvature, discrete curvature and curvature flow. So you can download the package and let us know if you have any questions. So I want to stop here and take um, questions or comments. Okay, thanks Jay for, for the very nice talk uh, with both breaths and depths. Uh, so we enter to into the panel session. So we have uh, two uh, panelists, two panelists. One is uh, Professor Shivan Gu. Uh, so he is from Stony Brook. Uh, is a renowned uh, a, a, a mathematician and computer science. And we also have Fen Luo from 
both course as a mathematician in differential geometry. Uh, so uh, how it works is that we'll first have one round of uh, discussions among the panelists, then, then we'll go to some of the questions on YouTube, okay? Um, so, so we start with the, uh, if you have questions, uh, comments regarding the uh, just talk, please, uh, you, can, you can raise. Maybe start with uh, David. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Chi for the invitation. Yeah, it's really, really nice work, yeah. <clears throat> uh, so we, we start uh, receive flow many years ago uh, because receive flow uh, is the tool uh, invented by Hamilton uh, for the purpose of proving Poincaré conjecture. And eventually, uh, Perlman used it to prove Poincaré conjecture. And a lot of mathematicians working along this direction to finish a uh, substance conjecture. And uh, so far, uh, Ricci flow is the most powerful way to design Riemannian metric from Gaussian culture. For, um, I mean, for graphics, computer vision, many engineering field and the medical imaging field, um, it's really fundamental and crucial to design different types of uh, Riemannian metric. The, the only way so far to calculate the metric, uh, I mean, rigorously, is based on Ricci flow. And using risk flow, we can do um, many things which cannot be accomplished by other methods. Um, it's really amazing for many methods. I mean, for many problems, which is be hard. But if we can find a good remaining metric, it becomes polynomial. For example, in computational topology, finding uh, the shortest word for, for, for loop in the fundamental group, this is be hard using combinatorial approach. But if we assign a hyperbolic metric, it becomes uh, very solvable. <clears throat> so such kind of a phenomena is really uh, amazing. So that means if we're using conventional um, complexity theory from computer science, computing receive flow is a uh, bit hard. But if we compute it from numerical PDE point of view, it's really trackable. So there are some theoretic gap um, along that direction. Then uh, recently, um, I mean, for surface risk flow is almost um, <clears throat> theoretically complete, but for higher dimensional manifold, it's, it's uh, widely open. Yeah, and recently three manifold risk flow become really hard, uh, especially for computational mechanics to design hex mesh. So there, there's some very deep relation between um, <clears throat> Uh, special hyperbolic metric and and hex mesh generation, quad mesh generation. So I believe there will be a lot of things along this direction um, in the near future. Yeah, mm. but still a lot of open problems. Yeah. Okay. Uh, phone. Do you have uh, comments? Oh uh, no, I think Professor Gu summarized everything. Okay. Good. Okay. So uh, we have one question from the from, on YouTube. So uh, thanks for the nice talk. I wonder in practical applications how Olivia visual curvature is computed at, as it requires the computation of EMD or the L1 optimal transport map. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, yes. So in practice, we compute. Uh, basically, there are two parts that are computationally probably the bottleneck. One is the all pair shortest pass, uh, just to get the distance between uh, uh, like, you know, neighbors of X and neighbors of Y. But uh, for this part, you could limit to only vertices within three hops away. So that is one uh, thing that uh, could be done to optimize the computation. And the second part is when you have a network where degree is high, for example, for certain uh, Facebook graph we work with, uh, the degree can be high. And that means when you compute the, the optimal transport, you have a, a very large number of vertices and you need to do that uh, 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 optimal transport. So we use Sinkhorn uh, algorithm to speed up that uh, optimal transport computation. And empirically, it actually is uh, is pretty manageable. Um, and we also have, I believe, uh, Chen Chun, uh, he has code on parallel uh, computation. 
Uh, so if you have like a multi-core, so you could uh, you know use that to speed up the computation of uh, uh, of this Ricci flow. So we are able to handle pretty large graphs. Uh, again, you know, depending on how large <laughs> we're talking about, but I think for uh, you know for the for the data set that we handle, we have no problem. Yeah, um, but if you're really talking about like in the Field size data, then yes, maybe maybe we need to think about uh, like cluster machine and uh, uh, you know for 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 handle really large uh, graphs. Yeah. Okay, so this another question from 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 uh, uh, on YouTube. Uh, so so I, maybe I can translate this slide differently into this question. So so the so question is asking right. So what kind of uh, Cluster structure can this kind of uh, rich flow type of uh, method capture, right? We cover, uh, we cover. For example, like, um, like some of the some of the some of the other methods, like special clustering, right? So they can, they the people analyze this kind of a uh, stochastic block model and trying to mm -hmm. trying to say that on certain conditions they can recover the underlying structure. So um, in terms of this kind of uh, which flow type of method, right? So what, what are the, 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 the advantages? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, that's a very good question. So basically I think it's partly related to the theoretical study of mm. uh, the community detection work. For example, um, you know, empirically we can show that it, it you know, it really partition and discover community very nicely. But uh, theoretically, what can be said? Um, I think this problem is still largely open. We had, again, like analysis for a very simple <laughs> setting. Uh, it's, it's a very special setting. We have a complete graph, and on each vertex, we put another complete graph. So for that case, we can analyze. We can write down you know, all these edge ways and how it evolves and so on and so forth. So we can show convergence and we can show the length at the end of the Ricci flow. In general, if we make it stochastic, uh, I think the challenge comes from analyzing this optimal transport uh, or the curvature evolution and you know, you know, potential like bound, upper or lower bound that in the you know, evolving process of Ricci flow. Um, yeah, so I I basically I don't have a currently a theoretical answer to that at the moment. I think this is a very interesting, you know, open problem that you know should be solved as the okay. next step. Yeah. 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 I think I think which flow is very powerful. Uh, so I prepared a few questions for, for, for both the speaker and panelists. Okay. So I think one question is related to what Jay mentioned in the talk, right? So um, thinking about the theory of differential geometry, we have the continuous theory. We have some nice theory about the triangular meshes, right? That requires some, some which, which can be considered special graphs, okay? Uh, but then for general graphs, I think, uh, so what is really the gap here, right? So do you think there are the, so what are the important properties of a graph, right? That somehow can bridge this gap. Okay, between the, the general graph and the, the special graph like triangular mesh. Mm -hmm. I can, okay, I think uh, uh, David and Fong can provide <laughs> their yeah. perspective, but I can say a few words about, you know, why it's challenging for uh, the graph setting. Um, mm -hmm. I think, first of all, we, the, for general, like complex network we work with, we really have heterogeneous, uh, situation that if you look at just like a neighborhood, right? So certain neighborhoods can be like very large, like high degree vertices. And, um, and certain neighborhood can be, you know, again, very different. Um, so I think this partly contribute to the theoretical challenge where you don't have like the homogeneous setting as in the triangulated surface case where you know locally you know your your neighbors and you know the orientation you know where you know where they're placed so here is we, we don't have that at all and um I, yeah i think that is part of the you know the challenge both in handling this data and in you know providing possibly the theory to handle it um you know maybe david and Fung can 
Okay. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. oh, maybe maybe I'm making this concrete. Okay, so is it actually the the graph has a geometric embedding in the ambient space? Important all the connectivity is uh, important to to close the gap. Okay, maybe David can have some comments on this. Okay. Uh, for for triangle mesh, triangle mesh basically is approximation for two D manifold, mainly surface. Then uh, on surface, there, there's a conformal geometry. So the risk flow is conformal, meaning mm, that the final remaining metric you get, okay, and the initial metric, they are conformally equivalent to each other. Mm. But for general manifold, like three manifold, so there's no conformal geometry. So then the uh, risk flow, mm, the, the remaining metric doesn't, uh, it's not conformal anymore. So that, that's the biggest uh, theoretic difference. Then for, um, mm, for three manifold, uh, within finite time, uh, at some point, you, you, you can get uh, if infinity curvature, which is called um, curvature blow up. So when you, when you encounter such kind of singularity, you have to uh, partition the manifold at that point, then redraw and receive flow. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, technical issues because of curvature blow up. But for post-surface situation, um, the behavior is much nicer. So basically, uh, for high genius surface or genius one surface, there will no culture blow up. You just run the flow and you get the final result. So, so I mean, for higher dimensional manifold, the things become much more complicated and they lose the conformality. So theoretically, it's more challenging. Then for graph uh, risk flow, there are two approaches. One approach is a, you do embedding first, embed the graph onto a topological surface, then you run surface risk flow. That one give you the guarantee from all uh, aspects. Another one is like, like this current approach, treat the graph as a special remaining manifold uh, with a pass metric and directly run risk flow. So basically these two approach fundamentally are very different. Yeah. I see. So basically risk flow for higher dimension manifold, it's much more challenging. Yeah. So that's the summary. Yeah. Then maybe before okay. can, can give more comments, yeah, or more deeper insights around this problem. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I want to add to David's what David said. So embedding a graph um, as a uh, on a surface. Now the trouble is you're actually going to get potentially complexity on the topology over there. So that you know, you know the, the challenge is the complexity somewhere, basically. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. So there are, could, there are many, many embeddings. Yeah, so right. the number of embeddings is uh, exponential. So yeah. the fun and the minimal genius is a bit hard. So for, so you get a, a very arbitrary embedding and get different final metric. So that causes a lot of troubles in practice. I mean, it depends on application, yeah. Okay, so, so for in the embedding uh, raw, so, so, so basically, the, uh, the David's uh, comment is that uh, depending on the like the, the, the underlying manifold, right? If the underlying manifold high dimensions becomes a lot more complicated, right? So essentially, we have the choice of so how, how, choose the embedding space, right? So I think that may, may affect the, does that affect the performance? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, to topologically, finding one embedding is a linear time. Okay. But, but finding the one with a minimal genus, that is a bit hard. Mm. So too many choices, just. Yeah. I see, okay. Yeah. I mean, topological embedding without geometry, but once you mm. have topological embedding, you can compute the remaining metric. Once you have the mm. metric, you can find embedding, yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay, another, another uh, uh, relevant question here is that, uh, so this is to, with for example, like, uh, uh, how about the dynamic data, right? So not, not static graph, how about the dynamic graph? Is, uh, is this uh, framework applicable to, to, to those dynamic data? I, I think for application perspective, we could, we can, uh, we can definitely apply for dynamic data. So think about, a social network that evolve mm. over time, right? So when you have new edges and new vertices that join, you could like run reach flow and you know keep up. And then maybe again, we haven't done anything, but just imagining that one could keep track of the changes to the distance metric and also use that as a way to characterize what has happened, what has changed uh, to the current graph. Um, 
Yeah, but that's a, that's a very that's a very good direction. Yes, this is a clearly, uh, you know, interesting problem. You know, many applications I can imagine. Yeah, from mm -hmm. the evolving perspective. Yeah. Okay, another another relevant relevant question is that how about direct graphs where the where the edges uh, we have right so it's not like uh, undirect right so we have certain mm -hmm. right so how 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 about direct graph? Mm -hmm. So the current framework applies for direct graph as well. So you you just need to define your neighbors, and then of course you know make the distance right from distance from x to y, and distance from y to x are no longer symmetric. But that's okay. I mean, you can incorporate that in the optimal transport framework. Mm. So, because it's like going from X to Y, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have, you know, we haven't worked with directed graph, okay. uh, like data, but yeah, okay. I, I imagine that can be applied. Yeah. Okay. So, now I have uh, uh, the final question is really about the, 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 for the impact out of each, right? So for example, like uh, and we know that this is a, a deep learning era, right? So uh, if uh, you are, uh, if we are looking, uh, asking a student, I know David has done a, a huge amount of work, right? So and uh, out of which in differential geometry, right? So to 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 high to to undergrads or high school students, right? So for for this p uh, type of uh, material, so. If uh, if uh, if a student is interested, okay, to into this, right? So what 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 are required uh, like uh, courses to take in order to understand this, and what are the, really the suggestions here to 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 really really for for the students, okay, uh, like uh, undergrads, okay, to get get familiar with this those. I think David and Feng can David may want to <laughs> answer this. Yeah. I, I think Feng is, is the best to answer this question. Okay, maybe yeah. Feng, you can like, give some comments on this. Uh, uh, mathematician, I think David, you, you say something, right? So you, from math perspective, you just learn some basic calculus and some geometry, like differential geometry, that should be sufficient for you to prepare. I mean, you need to have some geometric intuition. But Professor Wu has done really fantastic work of introducing and really mesh these two area together and produce a really uh, amazing applications in computer science and many areas. Like he can tell you more. Yeah, yeah from, from computer science point of view, um, basically, uh, if you know um, <clears throat> computer graphics, and uh, if you know uh, how to represent surface data using half-edge data structure, okay, how can you represent different topological concepts. Um, everything is based on pointer in C language. Then uh, from coding point of view, you should be fine. Then uh, from optimization point of view, it, it is just a convex optimization. Uh, everything reduced to, um, to calculate Heisen matrix using linear algebra. So basically, um, so if you know uh, geometric coding using pointer to re represent a uh, half height data structure, if you know a uh, convex optimization, okay, and if you can represent graph, then uh, from computational point of view, it should be fine. Yeah. Mm. Then there are a lot of, I mean, uh, we, we wrote uh, several textbooks on this topic. So we, we put uh, open source code online. So then uh, every CS major can download and play mm. with them. Yeah, also GS code. Yeah, by reading the code, they can learn the computational method without any difficulty. But, but the, 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 the real challenging part is to prove the math, mathematical aspects like, like existence, convergence, convergence rate, stability. So those require different knowledge. Yeah. But from okay. competition point of view, it should be straightforward. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Jay. Do you have some concluding remarks on this? Um, so I, I, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, my collaborators and students. I should say they you know, did all the work. <laughs> so, okay. uh, and uh, again, if anyone has uh, interesting data set or if anyone has uh, questions about running the code on their data, you know, we'll, we'll be happy to help. Um, yep. Okay, thanks. And thanks, Jay. Thanks, David. Thanks, Flo, and you know, uh, for 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 this nice seminar and for, for spending your time with uh, with uh, our audience. So this uh, concludes the this week's uh, 3D GV semi seminar, and uh, see you next week. Okay.
Okay, thanks. Okay. Yeah. Thank thanks. You. Thanks.